Hello everyone, it's my pleasure and the great honor to share with you this very important lecture about tips and the tricks in the use of oral anticoagulant in patients with atrial fibrosis. Our agenda will include general approach followed by specific populations. Let's start with the general approach. Let's start with the general approach for anticoagulation in patients with AF. It is also known as AF three-step patient pathway for stroke risk stratification and the treatment decision making. The first step in the decision making is A, anticoagulation or avoid stroke. And the aim is to identify the low risk patients who don't need antithrombotic therapy. The second step is to offer stroke prevention, which is oral anticoagulant, to those with one or more non-sex stroke risk factors. The third step is the choice of oral anticoagulant. It is preferred to be a NOAC given their relative effectiveness, safety and convenience. These drugs are generally considered as a first choice for stroke prevention and the second choice will be warfarin or vitamin K antagonist with good time in therapeutic range more than 70. This is a simple algorithm for the appropriate choice of the oral anticoagulant in patients with atrial fibrillation. Patients with AF uh, with concomitant significant mitral stenosis or mechanical prosthetic valves will be indicated for warfarin regardless the chat vasco score and the NOACs are contraindicated in this population while if the patient don't have significant mitral stenosis and there is no history of prosthetic valve implantation we will calculate the chat vasco score if the chat vasco score is zero in male or one in female then there is no need to give antithrombotic treatment. If the chat vasco score is 1 in male or 2 in female, oral anticoagulant should be considered. If the chat vasco score is 2 in male or 3 in female, then oral anticoagulant is recommended. And it is also important to calculate the has blood score to identify the risk of bleeding has blood score three or more will uh, indicate a high risk of bleeding what about the specific population let's start with prosthetic valve and other valvular heart disease As we said before, patients with prosthetic mechanical heart valves or significant mitral stenosis should receive vitamin K antagonist regardless of the chat vasc score and there is no role for NOAC in these patients. NOACs are contraindicated in patients with prosthetic mechanical valve and use of NOAC is not recommended in patients with AF and moderate to severe mitral stenosis, mitral valve area 1.5 cm square or less. What about the other native valvular heart disease? For stroke prevention in AF patients who are eligible for oral anticoagulant, no wax are recommended in preference to the vitamin K antagonist in patients with native aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, or mitral regurgitation. What about the tissue valve? 
Oral anticoagulant is recommended for patients undergoing implantation of surgical pyoprosthesis who have other indication for anticoagulation. No wax should be considered over vitamin K antagonist after three months following surgical implantation of pyoprosthetic valve in patients with AF. No wax may be considered over vitamin K antagonist within three months following surgical implantation of a tissue valve in mitral position in patients with AF, but this is given only a class to be recommendation. What about patients with ischemic heart disease? Patients with ischemic uh, heart uh, disease in AF patients eligible for oral anticoagulation, it is recommended to use NOAC in preference to vitamin K antagonist in combination with antiplatelet therapy. In patients with high risk of bleeding, high has bled score 3 or more, Rivaroxaban 15 mg once daily should be considered in preference to Rivaroxaban 20 mg once daily for the duration of single or dual antiplatelet to decrease the bleed. Also, we can consider use of Dabigatran 110 mg twice daily instead of 100 50 mg twice uh, daily uh, in, uh, in combination with single or dual antiplatelet therapy to decrease the bleeding risk. In AF patients with indication for vitamin K antagonist in combination with antiplatelet therapy, vitamin K antagonist dosing should be carefully regulated with the target INR between 2 and 2.5 and the time in therapeutic range more than 70%. What about the recommendations for acute coronary syndrome? In AF patients with acute coronary syndrome undergoing uncomplicated PCI, early cessation after one week of aspirin and the continuation of dual therapy with oral anticoagulant and B2Y12 inhibitor, mainly colobidogrel, for up to one year is recommended if the bleeding risk is high and the ischemic risk is low. While if the ischemic risk is high and the bleeding risk is low, we can give triple therapy for one month including aspirin, colobidogrel, and the oral anticoagulant, and then you can drop aspirin after one month and continue on oral anticoagulant with colobidogrel. What about chronic coronary syndrome? Also, patients with chronic coronary syndrome are classified into two categories. The first category is the high risk of bleeding and the low ischemic risk. You can drop aspirin after one week and continue on dual therapy with oral anticoagulant and clobidogrel for up to six months. While if the ischemic risk is high and the bleeding risk is low, you can Consider triple therapy with aspirin, colobidogrel, and oral anticoagulant for one month. And after one month, you can stop aspirin and continue on colobidogrel and oral anticoagulant. What about stroke and GIT bleeding? How to deal with anticoagulation in these scenarios? In AF patients with ischemic stroke or TIA, long-term secondary prevention of a stroke using oral anticoagulant is, rec is recommended if there is no strict contraindication for the use of oral anticoagulant and for sure no wax are preferred over vitamin K antagonists. 
In AF patients presenting with acute ischemic stroke very early anticoagulation within the first 48 hours using unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, vitamin K antagonist is not recommended. According to the size of infarction and the risk of hemorrhagic transformation, we can decide the appropriate timing for restarting the oral anticoagulant therapy. We, ob we obtain brain imaging on uh, admission if there is no hemorrhagic transformation and the patient is presenting with uh, TIA and uh, there is no acute ischemic lesion on brain imaging and no clinical worsening, you can consider restarting the oral anticoagulant after one day. If the patient was presenting with TIA with acute ischemic lesion on brain imaging and no clinical worsening, consider restarting after one to three days. In patients presenting with persisting mild neurological deficit with clinical improvement or at least no clinical worsening, consider restarting oral anticoagulant after three days. In patients with persistent moderate neurological uh, deficit after exclusion of hemorrhagic transformation by brain CT or MRI, Consider restarting the oral anticoagulant within or after 6 to 8 days. Persistent severe neurological deficit and after exclusion of hemorrhagic transformation in the brain CT or MRI. Consider restarting oral anticoagulant after 12 to 14 days. If there is evidence of hemorrhagic transformation, provided that there is a clinical improvement and no clinical worsening, with a documented significant reduction of hemorrhagic transformation by brain CT or MRI on the day before restarting the oral anticoagulant, consider restarting the oral anticoagulant after 28 days and consider aspirin until initiation of oral anticoagulant and uh, take care that this algorithm is based on expert opinion no randomized controlled trial data available yet In patients presenting with intracranial uh, hemorrhage, we have many uh, factors that will favor the withholding versus restarting the oral anticoagulant, uh, including uh, presence or absence of reversible or treatable cause of bleeding, multiple cerebral microblood, severe intracranial bleeding, older age, bleeding during interruption of anticoagulation, uncontrolled hypertension, bleeding on adequately or underdosed NOAC, chronic alcohol use, need for duct after PCI. Then after you, do, after you, after you uh, assess all these uh, factor uh, and the net assessment is in favor of restarting anticoagulation according to multidisciplinary decision, uh, if yes, consider re-initiation of oral anticoagulant after 4 to 8 weeks. Uh, if no, consider no anticoagulant versus left atrial appendage occlusion. What about re-initiation of oral anticoagulant after GIT bleeding? Following a major GIT event, no wax should be restarted as early as feasible usually four to seven days if the risk of a stroke persists and outweighs the risk of recurrent uh, bleeding what about patients with congenital heart disease oral anticoagulant should be considered in all adult patients with intracardiac repair cyanosis fontaine 
circulation or systemic RV and the history of atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or even intraatrial reentrant tachycard. And regardless, the chat vasco score. In AF patients with other congenital heart disease, anticoagulation should be considered in the presence of one or more non sex stroke risk factors. What about patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? In patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the clinical AF anticoagulant, anticoagulation is recommended with DOAX as a first line option and the vitamin K antagonist as a second line option, regardless the Chadwaski score. In patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the subclinical AF detected by internal or external cardiac device or monitor with duration of atrial fibrillation more than 24 hours for a given episode anticoagulation is also recommended in hcm patients with atrial fibrillation and the af episode was more than five minutes but less than uh, 24 hours and also detected by internal or external monitor anticoagulation with DOAC as a first line option and the vitamin K antagonist as a second line option should be considered what about patients after ablation and after cardioversion For cardioversion of AF or atrial flutter, effective anticoagulation is recommended for minimum of three weeks before cardioversion. When thrombus is identified on transesophageal echo, effective anticoagulation is recommended for at least three weeks before cardioversion of AF. For patients with atrial fibrillation more than 24 hours undergoing cardioversion, therapeutic anticoagulation should be continued for at least four weeks after cardioversion. In patients with AF duration less than 24 hours, and you are sure from this duration, and very low stroke risk, Chad Vasco score 0 in male or 1 in female, both the cardioversion anticoagulation for 4 weeks may be omitted. What about patients with AF ablation? It is recommended to give therapeutic oral anti coagulation for at least three weeks before ablation or alternatively you can use transesophageal echo to rule out lift atrial or lift atrial appendage thrombus before ablation and after ablation it is recommended that systemic anticoagulation with warfarin or NOAC is continued for at least two months post-ablation. What about the recommendations for uh, anticoagulation after AF surgery? Long-term oral anticoagulant is recommended in patients after AF surgery and the appendage closure based on the patient's thromboembolic risk assessed with a CHAD vas What about patients with liver cirrhosis? Patients with liver cirrhosis are subclassified in two, three categories. A child A, child B, a child C. All NOACs can be used with normal dose in patients with liver cirrhosis a child A. Patients with liver cirrhosis a child B, you can use all NOAC with caution, except rivaroxaban, which is not recommended. 
In patients with liver cirrhosis, a child see all no wax are not recommended and the only available option is warfarin. What about renal patients? The appropriate choice of oral anticoagulant in patients with AF and concomitant chronic kidney disease will depend on the creatinine clearance. In case of warfarin, you can use warfarin regardless the creatinine clearance level and use adjusted dose to keep INR between 2 and 3. What about dabigatran? If the creatinine clearance between 30 and 50, use dabigatran 150 mg twice daily. If the creatinine clearance between 15 and 29, use dabigatran 75 mg twice daily. If the creatinine clearance below 15, dabigatran is not recommended. What about rivaroxaban? Rivaroxaban, if the creatinine clearance between 30 and 50, Use 15 mg once daily. Creatinine clearance between 15 and 29. Use Rivaroxaban 15 mg once daily as well. And if the creatinine clearance is below 15, Rivaroxaban is not recommended. Edoxaban use 30 mg once daily if the creatinine clearance between 30 and 50. And it is not recommended if the creatinine clearance is below 30. What about abexaban? If the creatinine clearance between 30 and 50, use 5 twice daily or 2.5 twice daily according to the other parameters including the age, body weight, and the serum creatinine level. According to the new era recommendations, creatinine clearance between 15 and 29 milli alone justify the use of reduced dose of abexaban 2.5 mg twice daily regardless the absolute creatinine level and the age and the body weight if the creatinine clearance is below 15 and no dialysis abexaban is not recommended if the creatinine clearance below 15 with dialysis Abexaban 2.5 or 5 mg twice daily according to the age and according to the body weight. For example, if the body weight is above 60 and the age is below 80, you will use full dose. And these are also the selection criteria for uh, NOAX obtained from the European Society uh, of uh, Cardiology, which include a dose adjustment according to the concomitant uh, uh, drugs. For example, you can use dabigatran 110 mg twice daily in elderly patients above 80 or with concomitant use or of verapamil or with increased risk of bleeding and uh, abexaban you can use 5 mg twice daily and uh, consider 2.5 twice daily if uh, 2 out of 3 criteria are fulfilled age 80 or more body weight 60 or less serum creatinine 1.5 mg or more edoxaban the standard dose is uh, 60 uh, milligram once uh, daily consider the reduced dose which is 30 milligram once daily if any of the following is fulfilled creatinine clearance between 15 and 50 milli per minute body weight uh, 60 uh, kilogram or less concomitant use of dorinidarone cyclosporin erythromycin or ketoconazole And let's move to pregnancy and lactation. No wax are contraindicated during a pregnancy and a lactation and therapeutic anticoagulation with heparin or vitamin K antagonist according to the stage of pregnancy is recommended for patients with atrial fibrillation. And finally, miscellaneous conditions. The first category is patients with contraindication for oral anticoagulation. 
Left atrial appendage occlusion may be considered for stroke prevention in patients with AF and the concomitant contraindication for long-term anticoagulant treatment such as intracranial bleeding without a reversible cause, surgical occlusion, or exclusion of the left atrial appendage may be considered for stroke prevention in patients with AF undergoing cardiac surgery. Patients with extreme body weight Patients meet FDA indication for DUAC with normal body weight ranging from 60 to 120 kg. You can use dabigatran, rivaroxaban, abexaban, edoxaban without, the need, without need for those adjustment. In patients with severe obesity with BMI more than uh, 40 or body weight more than 120 kg, use rivaroxaban or abexaban with cushion and avoid dabigatran and edoxaban. In patients with body weight below 60 kg, use adjusted dose of abexaban or edoxaban and avoid dabigatran rivaroxaban. Patients with AF and cyrotoxicosis, uh, and let's uh, have a look on this uh, very recent uh, uh, meta-analysis that was published uh, in May uh, 2022, talking about the efficacy and the safety of anticoagulation in cyrotoxic atrial fibrillation. Current guidelines make no specific recommendations on anticoagulation for people with cytotoxic atrial fibrillation. Experts recommend anticoagulation in cytotoxic AF until an eothyroid state and sinus resin are achieved. What about AF in cancer uh, patients? No wax can be used in cancer patients with AF except patients with GIT or genitourinary cancer who are considered unsuitable for no wax therapy. Thank you so much.